peace to you from God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. On Friday nights at 8 p.m., 1978 to 1982, many people all across the United States would gather around their television sets to watch one of the latest shows on TV, The Incredible Hulk. It's not working. The Incredible Hulk. Remember that show? The TV series was about a mild-mannered doctor who had an incident, an accident with gamma radiation that under stressful conditions would transform him into this big, giant, green, strong monster man. A part of the show's ongoing theme was Dr. David Banner trying to get rid of the Hulk that lived in him, always under the surface, ready to break through at any time. In the introduction to that show, the narrator would say this. This is what he would say. When David Banner grows angry or outraged, a startling metamorphosis occurs. And it was no accident that the writers of the show used that word, metamorphosis. Every once in a while, Hollywood gets it right. They actually got it right by choosing that particular word, metamorphosis. We'll get back to that in just a second. That was 78 to 82. In 2008, the movie, The Incredible Hulk, was released. And if you saw it and looked really deeply at it, probably deeper than anyone was ever supposed to mean to actually look at this movie, the underlying basic theme of that movie was, who are we, really? Core of ourselves, deep down, who really are we? In other words, if we could get a good look at the nature of who we really are, what would we see? In that movie, the 2008 movie, gave background information on Dr. David Banner, and the people who saw that movie learned something that we never learned from the television series. And that was that David Banner had been corrupted by his father at a very early age, that the Hulk was always inside of him from a young boy on. And it took the incident with the gamma radiation to bring out the Hulk. <coughs> the movie itself is really about identity and struggle. <coughs> Who is Dr. Banner really? What can he do to keep the Hulk from coming out and destroying <coughs> things? And all through that movie, too, this theme of metamorphosis was happening. Now, what does the Incredible Hulk have to do with Jesus on Transfiguration Sunday? Not much, I'll admit. But, <laughs> it's when you look a little bit deeper, we see it. Let's take a look at our text, especially our Gospel text, especially this word, transfigure. And as soon as we do that, it's all going to make sense. I hope. Here it is. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as the light. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, remember I issued you that invitation last week. If you have your Bibles with you, you can write a note in your margins. If not, you can write it in your bulletins, take it home, put it in your Bibles later. That word, transfigured, is from the Greek word, metamorphomai. It's the word we get our word metamorphosis from. And what it literally means is the act of giving outward expression of one's inner character. That outward expression coming from and being truly representative of the inner character. So the Mount of Transfiguration then was very simply an outward expression of the inner character of Jesus. In other words, the Transfiguration, or if we're going to quote we're going to do it right. From the original Greek, we'd say the metamorphosis of Jesus was not something that was done to Jesus. It was something that came from him. His true nature shone through to the outside. So if we were to put this all together then, this verse would read literally, the manner of Jesus' outward appearance was changed before them. And the outward appearance coming from him was truly representative of his inner nature. Back to the Hulk. 
When David Banner grows angry or outraged, a startling metamorphosis occurs. And that's why I said every once in a while Hollywood gets it right. They were actually showing their understanding of the Greek when they used that word metamorphosis. The manner of Dr. David Banner's outward appearance would change and would be reflective of his, two, of his true inner nature. That's what 2008 movie was all about. Now, one more reference to the Hulk TV show. I'm done with that. In 2012, the movie The Avengers was released. And the Incredible Hulk, Dr. David Banner, was part of the cast or part of the, the crew of that movie. In the climax of that movie, you know, things are blowing up, the world is coming apart, it seems everything's going wrong. One of the characters in that movie says to David Banner, now would be a really good time for you to get angry, Doctor. Is one of the changes of the Hulk, and here's the response. That's my secret, he says. I'm always angry. And then he immediately turns into the Hulk. In other words, what he was saying is, that's my secret. Just beneath the surface that you see, the real me. And it can come out at any time. I will never be free from who I really am. Here's the point with this. The TV shows and movies, whether you saw them or not or, or liked them or not, here's the thing. They all have the same theme running through them that runs through all of humanity all around the world. Inside, at the very core of who we are, we're broke broken, and we can't fix ourselves. Underneath, you, you all look at me, you see Michael Stahl up here, but you don't really see me. Underneath this is the real me, and it's broken. When we look around the pews this morning, we see each other, we don't really see the real us sitting next to you, or behind you, or in front of you, or across from you. What you see is the shell. The real person inside broken. Underneath what people see is the real us, and it ain't pretty. And we see the brokenness of people all around us. We see it in the way people talk to one another. We see it in the way one culture treats another culture. We see it in the wars that are waged all around the world. We see it in the way Christians are persecuted all around the world. We see it in our own lives. When the Hulk inside of us comes out broken. The real us, the real you, the real me is broken. We are not what we were meant to be. We are not what God originally created. And you and I have inherited that corrupt nature from our father, from Adam, and from our mother, Eve. We're broken. There's nothing we can do about it. And if the real me and the real you were to come out in some sort of visible, tangible form, wouldn't be a big green man. But maybe if what we saw in all around the world, not just you and me, but all around the world too, what we would see is a bunch of sin-infused hearts. Maybe we'd see a bunch of dead hearts. We'd see angry people, lost people, Desperately scared people, and very lonely people, just wanting to know that somebody sees them and hears them and cares. Let's go back to Jesus. On Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus had a metamorphosis, literally, from the Greek. And his true inner nature showed through. He was, for just a few moments, letting the glory of who he really is shine in the darkness of the minds of Peter, James, and John. And in that time of being and showing his true inner self and talking with Moses and Elijah, he also revealed his heart. You don't see it much in Matthew, but Luke also reports the same incident. And Luke gives us a detail that Matthew doesn't. This revealing of Jesus' heart comes through in the book of Luke, where Luke writes in chapter 9, verse 31, they, that
that is, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, spoke about Jesus' departure that he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. And Jesus, full glory, full glory, talking with the great lawgiver Moses and the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, Elijah, Jesus' heart is truly exposed. The true inner nature of his heart comes out. And you know what he's talking about? He's talking about you. His thoughts and his heart are all about you and me. He talks openly and frankly about the cross. He will willingly go to for you and for me. And you know, since his birth, this is actually the first time that Jesus has let his full glory come through. All through his life he's been, oh, walking around, not fully revealing his full glory, his full nature, his full self. But even now, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he does, his heart and his thoughts are still the same. His purpose has not changed. Even in the fullness of his glory, it's all about you. It's all about us. He goes to the cross willingly for us. Today is the last Sunday before Lent. After today, sometime between the Sunday afternoon and Wednesday afternoon, everything's going to change in this church. The colors will go to deep purple. Banners will be changed. If we can get to the garage, the cross in the garage, we'll go up and back and plow away through the snow. It's all going to change after today. And the tones of the readings and of the music will reflect the season of Lent. At the Mount of Transfiguration, or rather, I'm sorry, after the Mount of Transfiguration, the rest of Jesus' earthly life is all about his journey to the cross. Starting Wednesday of this week, Ash Wednesday, the next few weeks of the church year are about Jesus' journey to the cross. He goes to the cross, and you and I get changed. We're transfigured, too. Now, let's go back to the real us. We are, by nature, broken, sinful, and unclean. That's true. That's why if we were to metamorphosize into who we really are, it would not be a pretty picture. But, in God's eyes, we who believe and are saved are covered in the righteousness of Christ. Do you know what that means? That means when God the Father looks at you and at me, he sees what the disciples saw that day on the mount. What he sees is the perfection of Jesus, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. He forgives our sins, that inner nature, that sinful person, and he only sees his son. Do you know what that means? That means that when God the Father looks at you and sees the righteousness of Christ given to you, he says the same thing of you that he said of Jesus. This is my beloved son, or this is my beloved daughter, with whom I am well pleased. That's what Jesus says about you. Now I have to be honest, I don't know about you all, but there are days when I don't feel worthy of God saying that he's well pleased with me. There are days I echo what Paul said in the book of Romans. The good I want to do, I don't do. The bad I don't want to do, this is what I keep doing. Chief of sinners though I be. You know what? That's called the law. And the law is doing what it is supposed to be doing at those times. And working on me and working on you when you feel that way too. It's supposed to do this. It's supposed to show us our sin and the need for the Savior. But after the law always comes the gospel. The gospel that to a certain extent is, is for lack of a better term, quote unquote, hidden a little bit in our text from Matthew but revealed a little bit more in Luke. The open talk about the cross and the suffering that Jesus is going to endure for you and me. This is the cross that frees us from the curse of the law, the cross that shows this, 
Jesus loves you right where you are. But he loves you too much to leave you there. He loves you too much, and he loves me too much to leave us that way. And then comes the empty tomb, the tomb that shows that God the Father is pleased with Jesus' sacrifice for us, and he has accepted it. The empty tomb that Jesus walked out of that first Easter morning to show that he's alive and well. And the empty tomb that signifies that death does not get to have the final word. Jesus does. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. So where do we go from here? Because in a few moments, we'll come up to the altar. We'll sing a little bit. We'll pray a little bit. I have a couple of announcements. <laughs> and then we'll go home. We'll leave this holy house. We'll leave God's house. So where do we go with all of this? Jesus metamorphosized into his true nature and revealed himself. Our true nature is sinfulness and brokenness and destructive hulk just waiting beneath the surface to break through that we've inherited from our father Adam and our daughter Eve. And yet Jesus takes the punishment for that nature and gives us the righteousness, his righteousness, in the eyes of God the Father. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 we read, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. That's why in 1 Peter we read, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed or, or bought back from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb without blemish and defect. So, where do we go from here? What do we do? Where we go from here is back out there. Back out to a world it's filled with fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of losing what they have. Fear of death. Fear of fill in the blank. That's where we go. We go to them. We let that light of the transfigured Jesus that he gives to us, that God the Father sees, we let that shine through us. You know what we are? You know what Martin Luther called you and me? We are little Christs to them. That's what we do. And, and then, when we sin, and we will, make no mistake about that, and when they see the sin, and oh, they will. Don't worry about that. They'll see it. You know what we do? We own it. We own the sin. We acknowledge it. We call it for what it is. We confess it. We ask for forgiveness from the ones we've sinned against and then receive that righteousness of Christ again. We continue to be his hands and his feet to the world around us. The world each one of us has been placed in on purpose and for a purpose to be the light of Christ to a world that's in darkness. So let's go to our light now. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, to see you in your full glory must have been an amazing thing for the disciples. <coughs> to hear you talk about the cross while in your full glory must have been a little confusing. Couldn't you save us without going to the cross? But there is no salvation without the cross. There's no atonement for sin without the blood sacrifice of the perfect one. Thank you for going to the cross for us. Thank you for laying down your life and enduring all you did for us. Jesus, thank you that even though our inner natures, our real selves are sinful and corrupt, you gave us your perfect nature in the eyes of God. We thank you, Father, for seeing us through the sacrifice of your Son. Now empower and embolden us and strengthen us, Holy Spirit, to be the people you want us to be in the places you have put us. How will they have the righteousness of Christ in the Father's eyes if they do not believe? And how will they believe if they never see and hear the good news in and through us? Help us to be little Christs to those around us. As 
we reflect the transfigured, metamorphosized Jesus to the world around us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.